Blog Talk Radio. Smith, this is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another Restoration. Glad to be here. It is Monday night, 10 o'clock p.m. here in Calgary, Alberta. It is June 17th, and uh, yeah, we're just picking up where we left off from last Monday, looking at information from havoca.org, H-A-V-O-C-A, Havoka, Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse. Um, they have some good information on that website um, for survivors of abuse, so if you haven't seen it, you can go take a look. Um, i was trying to put the link into the chat room and I wouldn't I couldn't get it to pop in there. But um I did put where the information is coming from. Havoka.org. And we're just gonna continue on looking at that. So yeah, I'm glad that you can join me and I appreciate everybody who's been tuning into the shows and you know, I I don't quite often have the chat room open but tonight it actually popped up for me so I will just leave it up there. <laughs> uh, most of the time I don't have it open. But um yeah, I appreciate everybody who's taking the time to listen into the shows, and, and hopefully you're getting something out of it. Um, I know that these shows, like they're helpful for me just to look at this information and read through it. It just makes it, it just makes sure that I'll continue on my healing journey because I'm busy and I'll put it off and you know do other things and um, instead of spending some time looking at what I need to look at. So we're looking at boundary issues, and if you think this information, like if you're a survivor of abuse, and you think this information might trigger you, you got to be careful because you don't want to be triggered and end up going backward in your healing journey. So you need to, if you don't know how to know whether you're safe enough to be listening, get that information. You can get it from ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and Morris Center Program, called the Survivor to Thriver Workbook. You can also get it from NASCA, N-A-A-S-C-A, NASCA.org. I'm the Alberta Ambassador for NASCA, National Association for Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And we're all survivors. We're all um, volunteers. And we all work to help other survivors of abuse, as well as just to educate the public regarding the issues of child abuse and, um, you know, the issues that adult survivors then have to go through. So, you can get information um, really about how to stay safe as, an, as a survivor of abuse all over the place. And you know, if you need more info and, and I don't list it here tonight, you can get a hold of me or get a hold of somebody at NASCA. Um, you know, we'll be glad to help you out with info that we might have that might be helpful for you. So if you're not sure if you're going to be safe enough listening, just turn the show off and you won't be hurting my feelings at all. And uh, just make sure you keep yourself safe so you don't, you know, go backwards in your healing journey and then, you know, regress and then possibly hurt yourself or hurt somebody else, right? It's very important. And, uh, you know, so you're not triggered. Other people listening, you just have to listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse, which is a very sensitive topic. And I've had to live with this my whole life, so, you know, I'm okay talking about it. But, um, you know, for some, some people may find it really uncomfortable or might bother you. So you have to make that decision for yourself and know what's good for you to listen to and know, you know, what what's not. So you make that decision for yourself and then turn the show off if it's bothering you or, you know, you won't be hurting my feelings at all. And we'll get right into this. So this week I'm doing good. I was a little triggered. I've been a little bit triggered, but then it was Father's Day um, yesterday. So 
I never really do all that well on Father's Day. <laughs> all those holidays that roll around that just remind me, you know, I see posts on Facebook, you know, it's, and I'm happy for all the people out there that had good dads, and it makes me happy to see it. And um, both of my parents were my abusers, so it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it goes. Um, so Mother's Day, Father's Day, very triggering for me. And so this is always a triggering time of the year for me with those two holidays rolling around. And, um, you know, just seeing the posts and stuff, uh, or my, you know, I sit there and I just remember my situation, my relationship with my own abusive parents. And I just, you know, it sort of drags me down a little bit. Um, I try not to think about it too much <laughs> because it's just depressing. But it always makes me happy to see some posts from people who've had good relationships with their parents. You know, it's wonderful. Um, I don't have a clue what that would be like, but I can imagine it would be very nice because I know what, you know, what it's like to be treated well by other people outside of my family and who who now are really my, my real family, right? Who... You know, so I know what it's like to be treated well by people. My husband, who just my late husband, who just passed away, um, he was awesome and he was very good to me. And so I know what love is, and I've been really blessed to know in my adult life some really wonderful people. And even in my youth, you know, people that were help try to helping try to being helpful to me uh, because of my situation. They kind of knew I was struggling and tried to help me out. And so you know, I've been really blessed to have people in my life that took sort of stepped in where my parents sort of. Um, didn't do the right thing by me. Other people sort of have, through the years, sort of made up for that in a way. And so I've been really blessed in that area, but not everybody is. And so, you know, it's kind of tough for people out there, especially with these holidays rolling around. So I was a little triggered and still am, and that's okay. I'm working on trying to quit smoking cigarettes, and because I'm so triggered, it's just, it's harsh. I'm just running back to the cigarettes and and it's terrible because I was doing so good. I went a whole month without cigarettes, and um, now I'm back to wanting to smoke. So it's it's I'm sure it's just triggering. So I'm gonna have to do some work. And so you know this show is good for me to do. So I'm glad to be back. So we'll get right into this. Um, you know normally I do a meditation and stuff, but because this information I want to cover it, and it takes this is a lengthy article here. This 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 boundary issue stuff. I haven't been doing that, but as far as how am I doing, I guess, you know, I'm sort of triggered, so I need to do some work. What do I need to focus on? Boundary issues are a huge issue for me, so I'm glad we're running through this stuff. I haven't been doing a lot of meditation or anything like that lately, mainly because uh, it's just been so difficult with my husband passing away, and I'm dealing with that. Um, Because I'm dealing with the grief of that, I find that I really can't concentrate too much on my healing journey right now, because the I have to, you know, it sort of has to be all done and sort of when it needs to be, sort of when it needs to happen. And because I'm still dealing with grief from my losing my husband, um, he passed away last August, so it's almost a year now. And I'm coping quite well with that, but I'm still grieving, of course, and missing him. And um, so I find that I can't really do the healing work that I need to do. But I'm hoping to be able to concentrate a little bit more on it to, you know, Every week, just to try to do a little bit more work in it, try to do more self-care, more self-nurture, um, do my studies like I was working on um, with the, um, oh, what was that called? It was a, actually, I still have it. It's just sitting here. I haven't done any work in it because it's dealing with the CSA child sexual abuse, and I sort of put that off, on, put that on hold. So there's a lot of things I need to work on, but I suppose, you know, as long as we're doing something, just anything to try to help ourselves. Um, including reaching out to others, you know, that's the important thing, is not to struggle on our own and not to suffer on your own and make sure you reach out and reach out to somebody, you know, whether it's a a friend or if you don't have a friend to talk to or, you know, somebody like that, then, you know, maybe join a support group. There's all kinds of them. I normally do um, uh, uh, facilitate uh, the ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a more center program. I have a a Calgary group that meets, but I had to put that on on hold because my husband passed away and I just couldn't deal with it. But um, I'd like to get back to that. So there are groups out there you can join online. You don't have to go anywhere, or or if you want to do something like that in person, you could look around your, your t- where you live and see if there's a group going. Um, just make sure that you get some help. You know, talk to a counselor, or whatever therapist, whatever. You know, just don't struggle on your own. Get some help. Right, that's very important. So we're going to pick up where we left off. We're looking at boundaries, and we're looking at the issue of um, choices. And it's from Havoka, H-A-V-O-C-A, Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse. 
information for survivors under their personal boundaries tab and looking at the section of it called choices and um we left off where they were saying that you know we do we need to own our choices we need to um but that we do have choices right so one of our one of our choices really is to make sure that we're not being abused stop setting ourselves up to be a victim right to remove ourselves from relationships with people that are abusive right um, we can end friendships, we can end relationships, we can leave jobs that are we're finding toxic or abusive. We can make these choices, but we really all have to own it. It's our life, right? Especially as adults, you know, as children, we don't have, we have a choice. I was talking about that last week. You know, children don't have a choice. Right? We're being abused, and, you know, I was abused in a, for years and years and years and by my parents and one of my siblings. All of my siblings were toxic, but one of my siblings sexually abused me, and so it was sort of horrific. You know, there was no safety in my home. Um, I really didn't have a choice. You know, I was just stuck in that, but I could have run away, I suppose. You know, I thought about it and, you know, thought about what I knew would happen to me on the streets. So I thought, well, I'd rather have my parents abuse me than somebody else. That was the whole issue of it. Um, because at least I knew what, what was coming instead of the mystery of somebody else. Everybody was an abuser to me when I was growing up. I really felt that all adults were abusers. And I, because I grew up abused from birth, right? So I didn't know anything different and I just didn't want to be dealing with somebody else's abuse. So, you know, this is just the issue. Um, It's so hard. You know, we need to, we need to know that we do have choices, right? As adults, as children, we didn't, but now we do. So anytime they said that we don't own our choices, we're empowering victimization. So when we blame the other person and or blame ourselves, it's a vital part of the process of learning to love ourselves and taking responsibility for being a co-creator in our, in our life, you know, that we can make these decisions, right? So we'll pick up from right here where we left off. It is essential to own that we have choices in order to escape the codependent suffering victim martyr role or the other extreme, which is being abusive in order to try to make others do it right. And that is to do what we want them to, right? So both the people who appear to be victims and the people that appear to be abusers are coming from a victim place in terms of blaming others for their behavior. Quote, unquote, I wouldn't have to hit you if you didn't talk to me that way is a victim statement. Both victim and perpetrator are coming from a victim perspective, blaming their behaviors on others or on themselves. Um, Quote, unquote, I can't help it. That's just how I am. So this is statements that people could make. Um, I know I heard that growing up. You know, I wouldn't have to treat you like that if if you weren't such a this and that, right? My parents were always blaming everything on somebody else, either their children or my mom was always blaming my dad. My dad was always blaming my mom. They were both always blaming the children for their for for the treatment that we were receiving. So I heard that lots when I was growing up, and I can't help it. That's just how I am. I haven't heard, never really heard that, but. My dad did say stuff like, well, that was just the way it was back then. That's just, you know, when I talked to him about, you know, later on in life as an adult, what he did and his part of the whole abuse stuff, because I used to talk to him about it. And, you know, he's he would never own up to it. He just said, well, that's just the way it was back in them days. You know, that's how you treated your children. That's how you treated your wife, you know. And I'm like, what a lame excuse, man. Um, yeah, it's it's. It's. I like what they have to say here about that. You know, it's essential to own that we have choices in order, in order to escape the codependent, suffering victim martyr role. My mom was that. My mom was abused as a child, and then she became this whole suffering victim martyr. You know, she was so hard done by because she had all these children to look after and didn't want all these children and this abusive husband. She was the suffering one when actually she was the abuser. Um, in the children's case, like she was abusing me and my siblings, well, I think when they were small and then as they got older, you know, she was still abusive, but she really liked to abuse the little ones because she could get a hold of you and really, <laughs> really give it to you. But um, it's really horrific, you know, like she was abused herself. So she then, you know, took on the situation where, you know, she was going to make sure that, that, People were going to do it right around her, so then she became an abuse abuser, and then blaming everybody else for her behaviors. Right? She would never take responsibility. Both, neither one of my parents took responsibility for their behavior towards each other or their children, which was kind of part of the reason why I was so angry at them because they would not own up to it and they would not apologize. They would never make it right. 
there's no way you can take back abuse. But, you know, as adults, then dealing with adult abu- adult uh, our adult abusers in an adult situation, what I wanted them to do was own up to the to what they did. And they never did. They never would. No, I was always blaming somebody else. Um, so we then have to be careful that we don't become that. That's real easy to do. Because then all of a sudden, well, you know, the choices that I made, if I blame those on my abusers, for instance, the choices that I've done uh, as an adult, you know, to whatever it may be, drug use, um, alcoholism, I mean, whatever we may have going on in our life, not being able to hold a job down, um, uh, all kinds of things like that, where we're just blaming somebody else and not taking some of the responsibility anyway, if not all of it, for some of it. No one's forcing me to smoke cigarettes. Right? I just do because I have an addiction problem that I need to work through. And it's my fault that I have that addiction problem. Even though the abuse, the, the reason that I'm sure the reason that I smoke is because of the abuse. It just helps me cope. It's my little security blanket. right? Instead of doing some other drug or something else or alcohol, which I don't really like alcohol that much. I don't mind having a drink here and there, but I'm not an alcoholic and never have been. But I'm a major smoker and I've just that's my that's my thing. That's what I do. It's my security blanket. You know, that's what I carry around with me. And I know that it's probably stemming from the abuse that I'm so hooked on it. I didn't start you know, nobody forced me to smoke a cigarette. It's not like somebody put a cigarette in my mouth and made me smoke it when I was younger that got me hooked on it. It's just the fact that as an adult, I need to make the right right choices for myself. So that's just one instant. You know, another another situation, you know, there could be any situation, right, um, that we might have going on in our lives, for instance, or being in an abusive relationship as an adult and blaming somebody else and saying that, there's, that they have to be in that relationship. It's like my mom. She did that, you know. She was abused herself as a child and then married this man. He abused her. She had all these children. She didn't really want these children, all of us, right? unfortunately. But she didn't want to look like a bad mother because her mother, her mother, her own mother was an abuser. See, her mother is the one that abused her. So she didn't want to be her mother. You know, she didn't want to look like this bad mother. So she, she stayed in this relationship and she really felt stuck. And I, I, I don't blame her because I know, I mean, you know, I saw what was going on. I, I understood the situation quite well and later on in life as an adult she really felt trapped and she would say that she was stuck in that situation what was she supposed to do i mean she would say she would talk about it she'd be like what was i supposed to do leave him and with all of you kids you know and then she ended of course she'd throw the guilt trip on well if i did leave and i would have lost you all you know to social services and i would have lost my children as if she really loved us and really to, really wanted us <laughs> it's like you know it was it was a lie the whole thing was a lie. But that that way she could keep the whole victim martyr thing going, see. We have choices to make, you know. And then at the end of the road we can't sit around and complain, really, about certain things. It's like you know, if I end up with lung cancer from smoking, whose fault is that? That's my fault, you know. If I don't allow somebody to treat me right and I end up in an abusive marriage, let's say, whose fault is that? for not getting out. It's not, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be my fault for the abuse cuz that's I'm I'm sorry there's just no reason to abuse anybody. But it would be my fault for not getting myself some help and getting out. That would be like me right now not not getting help and uh, self-injuring and ending up in the hospital because of self-injured. Whose fault is that? Nobody would be forcing me to fault to self-injure. That'd be my fault. We have to, as adults, take responsibility for our behavior. We also have to take responsibility for our actions, and we have to take responsibility for our choices because they truly are our responsibility as an adult, and it's tough. It really is because <laughs> half the time, I mean, half the time, I don't know what to do because I, I, I don't have the information. I'm missing the information. I don't have, what it, I don't have the information on how to be a healthy adult. I have the information on how to be a very screwed up dysfunctional adult I can do that really well but I don't know how to do anything right because I don't have that information so I have to figure it out like as I go along I have to get help I I have to watch healthy people and how they operate (laughs) people that are that have healthy um, you know lifestyles and healthy ways of thinking I have to kind of watch them and try to mirror them 
and you know you run into people or you know see somebody that you know has a healthy lifestyle going on i mean nobody's got a perfect life i mean that's just absurd but these there there's there's people out there that do seem to have a good head on their shoulder and seem to have their life pretty straightened up you know going pretty quite well for themselves i tend to try to mirror people like that because i'm like well they're doing this and they're doing that that seems to work but you know i'm nobody's perfect and and i don't necessarily come down too hard on myself for um not getting it right all the time because i'm coming from behind the eight ball you know that's the thing i'm not expecting to to be able to do the things that these people are able to do you know, it's because I don't have the skill set, right? And that's, you know, it takes me so much, it's so much more of an effort, really, for survivors of abuse, because we don't have those skill sets. So this is why it's really important to do these do this work and do these studies and read through these, this material. You can pick and choose what's, what, what, what sort of, like I pick and choose what, um, a, what what's actually, um, how do you want to say that, what applies to me. Like some of the stuff, if it doesn't apply to me, I just leave it. But, but if it does apply to me, I pick it up like a sponge and I try to remember, or I'll, you know, I'll keep it somewhere. I'll keep the information in a file or whatever, or I'll keep the book and I'll, you know, mark the page or whatever, um, you know, because not all information is going to be useful to us, but but some of it is, and that's the stuff to, to concentrate on. And so some of this stuff's interesting. Like they said here. Um, You know, both the people who appear to be victims and people that appear to be abusers are coming from the victim place. It's that's bizarre. That's quite interesting. Because when we look outside for self-definition and self-worth, we are giving power away and setting ourselves up to be victims. We are trained to be victims. We are taught to give our power away. As just one small example of how pervasively we are trained to be victims, consider how often you have heard have heard have said or heard someone say, "quote unquote," I have to go to work tomorrow. When we say, I have to, we are making a victim statement. To say, I have to get up and I have to go to work is a lie, they said. So they said, no one forces an adult to get up and go to work. The truth is, I choose to get up and I choose to go to work today because I choose to not have the consequences of not working. So today, uh, to, to say, I choose, is not only the truth, it is empowering and acknowledges an act of self-love. So when we have to do something, we feel like a victim. Oh, I have to do this, right? I have to do that. Um, I have to do laundry. <laughs> That's something that I do have to do. Um, and because we feel victimized, we will then be angry and want to punish whomever we see is forcing us to do something we do not want to do, such as our family or our boss or society. And we always have a choice. If someone sticks a gun in my face and says, for instance, your money or your life, I have a choice. I may not like my choice, but I have one. In life, we often don't like our choices because um, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and we're terrified of doing it wrong. It's kind of interesting what they have to say here. Even with life events that occur in a way that we seemingly don't have a choice over being laid off work or the car breaking down or a flood, etc., we still have a choice over how we respond to those events. So we can choose to see things that feel like and seem to be tragic as opportunities for growth. And we can choose to focus on the other, on the half of the glass that is full and be grateful for it, or to focus on the half that is empty and be a victim of it. We have a choice about where we focus our minds. You know, this is so true, and this is exactly where, I guess, what what feeds me and gives me the fuel to do what I'm doing, because I watched my parents do this half empty glass thing all the time. And, oh, life was so tragic. Everything was... Uh, when I was growing up, my because my parents were mentally ill, um, with different, um, like my dad was psychotic, literally, um, with uh, schizophrenia. My mom was, uh, but they used to call it manic depression, but she was it's it's borderline. What do they call that? Uh, no, um, what is that? Uh, manic depression, bipolar. Nowadays they call it bipolar, but but it used to be called manic depression. So everything was a crisis. Every little thing was a crisis. You know, you spill your milk, it's a crisis. Oh, my God, somebody's got to get beat, right? It's like 
you know, if I spilled my milk, I'd get beaten on because, oh, I made a mess. Oh, I spilled the milk. How could I do that? I'm an insolent little rotten child that needs to be beaten on, you know. Or if I come in the, if I used to come in the room and, and with a look on my face, a certain look on my face, it was a crisis, you know. My mom would be like, get that look off your face, right? You know, and then just give her an excuse to beat on me, right? Everything was this crisis. It's all in how you choose to respond to things and how you choose to see things. You know, because I grew up around such crazy, absolute crazy behavior. Um, because, you know, my dad, I mean, you can read my books if you want to. You can go to my website, Born in Hell. I've got them there. for You can read them for free if you want to. I've got them there as PDFs, but you, you can buy them if you want to. But I just put them there for free because I don't want the money for those books. I really just wanted the information to stay out there for my public information as well as for my brothers, you know, because their lives were just so horrible. And, and you know, it was I just feel so terribly sad for my brothers, you know. They, they died such horrific deaths, and they lived such horrific lives. They never really got to know love or care. They never really got to know anything good. It's unfortunate. But, um, you know, it's it's all in how we look at it. And this is what I decided at the age of 42. I was like, wow, am I just going to be sit here and be a victim and, and continue this this cycle on of that I had myself in this cycle of wanting to end my life and uh, suicidal ideation and you know, I'd never attempted suicide or just always thinking about it because my parents had set us up for that. And, you know, it just, and my two of my brothers killed themselves and, you know, it's just horrific. So I thought, am I just going to continue this on? Like, what's, like, what? I mean, I know I'm screwed up, right? I know why I'm screwed up. So why, why do I keep doing the same thing? It's like, and expecting different results. You know, I could go to work and work all day, no problem, have fun at the barbecues, no problem. I'm a very high-functioning survivor of a, of horrific abuse. And yet, you know, you come home, I'd, I'd come home at the end of the day, sit on the couch and want to end my life. Can't cope, can't cope with myself, with my life, with my past. And I thought, something's got to change, <laughs> man, I just can't keep doing the same thing. You know, like at 42 years old, it took me to that age to finally pull it together enough to get to realize that I need to help, you know, and that's ridiculous. But I'm so glad that I finally, finally did something about it. Right. Um, but, you know, this is the issue, like uh, to 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 continue seeing things the same way. is tragic. That's what's tragic. Because it doesn't, it, it, you, they never get anywhere. My parents never ever reconciled. They, you know, hated each other right up until the end. <laughs> it, it was just absolutely a nightmare. Like they would not, and, and no matter how much their children told them that they loved them, and it, it, none of it mattered to them because they were so self-centered and so um, full of anger and so full of, of hatred for their life that they created. I mean, they didn't create the fact that they were both abused. Both of my parents were abused as children. But the issue is is they didn't get any help, you know. And they just continued on in that horrible, horrible, horrible spinning, spinning, spiraling downward into this nightmare, you know. And the thing is, is we don't have to do that. We have choices. We we have choices on how we're going to respond every single day when we wake up in the morning. Every single day when I wake up in the morning, I realize that it's just a great opportunity, you know, that I have that a lot of people didn't get. And I just try to make the best of it, you know, and look at the good things instead of the bad things, right? We have about a minute left. This show just goes so incredibly fast. It's just, wow. <laughs> I can't believe a half an hour is already gone. But anyway, um, I would say, you know, whatever you do, get some help. Do not struggle on your own. Like if you can't cope and you don't know what you're going to do, you call a crisis line. You do the right thing. You get yourself some help. You don't struggle on your own and, you know, spiral out of control. You don't deserve that. Nobody does. But we have to make a a choice as an adult to want to to see things differently, to see ourselves differently. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is taking it one step at a time, one, you know, like they said, one day at a time, one moment at a time. 
it's ba- it's really for me it's kind of like it's not just a daily thing it's kind of like an hourly thing <laughs> it's just like you know I, I keep focusing on this right so you know you do whatever you have to do but you take it easy and get some help have a good night everybody talk to you soon <laughs>